Okay, so do you know what Dark Matter is? Only because you just told us. Okay, so Dark... Yeah. Nobody really knows what it is. We don't know what it is. It's, it's, it's a mass that's out there in the galaxy, in the universe. We measure it in galaxies mainly. When we, when we measure how fast galaxies rotate, we find that they're rotating a lot faster than they should be if all the mass they contained was just in the visible light. So right. when we add up all the stars that we can see, the mass that we measure, it doesn't add up to how fast they're spinning. If you use sort of Newtonian dynamics, um, standard physics, there's a lot more mass in there that we can see. So we you think can there's this. It back to when everyone started moving to find out how fast it should be moving today. That's what um, no, it's, it's actually a very simple equation. It just relates the mass and the radius of the galaxy right. to its rotation speed. And you find that it should be slowing down at large radiuses, you know, big spiral galaxies where they have spiral arms and they're spinning around. You find that as you move outwards, there's less. So if you know what a galaxy looks like, there's a big bulge in the center that's very bright and the, you think that most of the mass is in the centre. As you move outwards, this kind of theory of, of gravity says that it should start to slow down because the, the density of mass within it is, is decreasing because there's less stars. Um, and, but what it doesn't, it stays constant. So the outside of the galaxy is spinning just as fast as the centre. And this kind of suggests that there is something within that galaxy that's, that's dark, that's not giving out light. It's not stars, it's not gas, it's, it's just completely dark. And we don't really know what it is, but we know it's there. And we can measure it with other ways. So it's been measured from the cosmic microwave background, which is this sort of relic radiation that comes from um, the big... So after the Big Bang, about 270,000 years after the Big Bang, there was a moment where the universe basically became transparent to, to light, to photons. And we can still measure those photons today. If you, you know, back in the olden days when you had to tune your own TVs, if you go between channels, you would have seen static. And within that static is actually some of the cosmic microwave background. So when, there was, when this was actually discovered, um, they thought they had, um, the guys who discovered it with radio telescopes thought that there was some bird poo on their telescope because they were measuring this constant radiation from all over the sky and they were like, what, what is this? This must be... It used to be referred to as the, the cosmic hiss. Is that yes, thing? yes, I think, it probably, yes, it will be, yeah. So, so it is just like a hiss in, in radio waves. It's this noise and it comes from all over the sky. And what it actually is, is it's photons, it's light that came, was emitted back, you know, very close to the Big Bang, about 270,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, and we can actually measure these photons and they, they tell us, you can measure them across the sky and you can look at the temperature differences between points in the sky. And it gives you a picture of what the universe looked like, you know, very early on. And you can see that most of it was, uh, compared to today, where you have a lot of structures, so you have galaxy struck, you know, uh, what we see in the universe now is filaments and voids. So we see big empty spaces and then we see bits where there's lots of galaxies. But back in the early days it was a lot more uniform, but there were sort of patches that were colder than others, so the, the temperature was very varied across the universe in the early days. But we can, what we can actually do is, is measure that and it tells you something about how much matter there was at each point in the universe. And you can see that the dark, the, what we can tell from it, by some very clever theory, which I don't understand as an experimentalist, um, we can tell how much dark matter there was in the early days of the universe at different points, and we can see that it actually, what it did was it seeded galaxy formation. So dark matter interacts gravitationally, it's heavy, it, it pulls things onto it, and the dark matter in the, in the, back in the early universe started to pull normal matter, like the gas and stars and dust, onto it, and that's how galaxies form. So, so dark matter is actually essential to our own existence because without it, everything would have just stayed very uniform. There wouldn't have been stars and galaxies. So it's, very, it's really important stuff. So we can measure it by that as well, and we can also measure it by how much... So we can measure the mass of, of galaxies and galaxy clusters by how much light they bend around them from a distant source. So this is called gravitational lensing, and this is where you observe like a very, very bright distant source, and you... You can measure um, something between us and that source if there's something there. The light is actually bent around it. So you can actually observe what's called an Einstein ring. And you can see that image of that distant galaxy is repeated across the sky in a ring because of the light being bent around it. So we can also measure, that's another way we can measure how much mass there is somewhere. And again, we keep finding consistently that about 90% of the mass is not visible to us. So we, we, uh, we understand pretty well like the sun and, and stars and how much they should weigh. But when we add up how, many, how much light there is, it doesn't, it doesn't match up with how much we measure from this sort of gravitational lensing. So that's why we know that there's this stuff there that doesn't give out any light, which you call dark matter. So your question was originally about, was originally about it going underground. So, so the reason, so we know it's there gravitationally, but we try and detect it by another way because we think it's a particle because everything around us is made out of particles. So we're made out of atoms and, and 
protons, neutrons, electrons, we think that dark matter is also a particle, but just one that doesn't give out light like, like our atoms do. So we, um, we basically look for it to in interacting via something called the weak force. So there are four forces in nature, which are uh, gravity, the strong force, the weak force, and the electromagnetism. So electromagnetism is the one we're most familiar with because it's how we see. Uh, you know, we see by light, light is, is a photon, it's an electromagnetic particle. Um, everything around us interacts by the electromagnetic force, but dark matter, we know it doesn't because we don't see it. Uh, the gravity, obviously, we, we're on the Earth, we're not flying off, so we know, we understand gravity as well. But the, so, the, with the dark matter, we think it interacts also by this weak force. So the actual particle of dark matter we look for are called, is called a WIMP, which is a silly name, uh, stands for the Weakly Interacting Massive Particle. And this is actually our best theory for dark matter today. So there are some really nice sort of theoretical motivations for thinking that dark matter interacts weakly, which is basically how much there is, when we measure how much there is by its mass. If it was in the early universe, if it was kind of interacting by this weak force, it, it basically all adds up to give the right sort of amount that we measure today. So we, we really have very strong theoretical motivations for it being weakly interacting. But um, so what these detectors do that I work on is we actually look um, for the weak interaction of a WIMP with an atomic nucleus. So what we're actually looking for is a very specific interaction where the WIMP comes along, it basically it knocks into an atomic nucleus and causes what we call a recoil, nuclear recoil. And so I had the, this is why I have this bucket. So this is kind of the basic analogy of the detector we use. It is just a bucket of, I mean, it's not made out of plastic, it's made out of titanium, but it's um, a big container of liquid xenon. And xenon is like a very heavy nucleus that, that has quite a high probability of interacting with, with the dark matter. And there's we... Lots of bits for it to hit into. There's lots of... There's lots of, space, there's lots of stuff in the in Yes, xenon. It's, very, it's very dense, exactly. So it's a very dense liquid and it contains these big heavy xenon nuclei, nuclei. And we... So the problem is with that though, is like every other particle out there will interact with the xenon as well. So that's why we have to go underground. So that's what I was getting to. Is we, we take this bucket and the other important thing about xenon is it gives out light. So you may know car headlamps are sometimes made from xenon. So xenon is what's called a scintillator, which means it gives out light when particles pass through it. So that's kind of the idea. You get this bucket, you wait for particles to go through it, they give out light and you detect the light with uh, what are called photomultiply tubes, which are these light detectors. And we put them on the top and the bottom and we view the bucket, that's why it's clear. You know. Xenon is very, very clear to its own light. So when it gives out the light, it's, it just passes straight out. We can, we can detect that light. Um, but every other particle will do the same thing. So photons, electrons, uh, neutrons, anything that comes uh, through the bucket will also give out light. So that's the main reason we go underground is because so on the surface of the Earth right now, we're getting bombarded by cosmic rays from space. So these are particles, they're just high energy particles, they come down from space, uh, sometimes they interact in the atmosphere, they create other particles, and these all, we're getting you know, bombarded with them right now, but we, we just don't, they're not dangerous. Uh, you've been you know, bombarded by them your whole life, but you wouldn't know. But, it, but our detector is so sensitive that it will see them. So we have to put it, we put it, um, so it's actually in uh, what was a gold mine in South Dakota in America. It's 4,850 feet, about one and a half miles or something, what, just over a mile underground. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's now, it's not, they, they ran out of gold, so they allowed us to turn it into a science lab. So it's now um, a dedicated science facility underground. And we put the detector down there because then it means that the rock absorbs all these, this radiation from space. So it's very quiet down there, like, as in quiet in terms of the amount of particles around you. So that makes it um, much easier to try and detect dark matter down there because it's so much quieter. So I had, um, thank you. So <laughs> this was my analogy was that, uh, so this is a cat. You see a lot of cats on earth. Uh, these give out, give out light in the detector just the same way that dark matter does. Now dark matter is, <laughs> is a unicorn. So we don't know that unicorns don't exist because we've never seen one, right? So it's the same thing, thank you. Same thing with dark matter. Um, we don't know they definitely don't exist, but they will also just give out some light in the same way in the bucket. <laughs> so we have to, um, <laughs> this is the, the thing is, is that up here there are lots of cats. So we go underground. We also um, try and shield the detector in lots of other ways. We put it inside a big tank of water to try and absorb some of the, so that's the thing with, with rock underground, it's also, it's radioactive, which means it gives out particles as well. So the whole motiv motivation for these underground dark matter searches is, is yeah, we want to avoid the cosmic rays, but then we go underground and the rock is spitting particles at us as well. So it, that makes it it's equally difficult. 
So we put it inside a big water tank and then what we actually finally do to, as the final layer is we look, um, we take the bucket and we basically just look for dark matter right in the centre because everyday particles, they come in and they immediately interact with the xenon. How big is yours? Okay, so it's, it's a bit bigger than this. So this, so the early kind of, um, the early dark matter experiments were even smaller than this. They were very, very little. And there was one up in um, Bowlby Lab in Whitby in the UK that was kind of probably only about that, that size, very, very small. Um, but it was like a proof of principle and it worked and they were like, okay, we can, we can scale this up because these technology, this technology is very easy to scale. So the one we have now is probably about this tall, like from me, for, you know, nearly as tall as me, about this wide. And it contains about 350 kilograms of liquid xenon. And we look right in the centre, like just kind of a uh, sort of circle, cylindrical section in the middle. And we say, and it's very quiet in there. Supposedly it's the most radioactively quiet place in the world apparently is the center of this detector and it right in there there's there's nothing interacting because all the standard particles they the everyday particles started to interact around the edges so we look in the middle and then we just have to wait that's the, the idea is and we we've run for um a total of about 400 days now um and no dark matter has turned up unfortunately but that's not the end because the thing is is you have to um what you can do when you don't find dark matter is you can rule out certain sort of um, types of dark matter and you can say okay so we know we haven't seen it so that means that dark matter of, of these masses and these sort of probabilities of interacting with the xenon they, they're not there but it's not we know that dark matter is not here because we've we've looked here and it hasn't shown up and the, the kind of analogy with the unicorns was like there's some portions of the magical forest where the unicorns don't live but they might live somewhere else so we have to keep looking and we can keep looking by making our detectors bigger. So the bigger the detector is, the more likely it is that some you might catch. You'd look with bigger detectors in the same place. So we haven't done yet, but that's what's happening. So the, the look detector I work for is called Lux, which is the large underground xenon detector. And Lux has just finished its second um, sort of WIMP search run, as we call it, where it's finished taking data now. And we've done, we haven't found dark matter, uh, but we have managed to put the world's sort of best constraints on the dark matter properties. But that's not the end because we still haven't found it. So what's happening now is, is we're taking Lux out later this year. So we, we take it out of the water tank that is in underground in, in South Dakota, and we're going to put in a bigger version, basically. So this one is um, about 350 kilograms of xenon. The next one is going to be 10 tons. So it's a big scale up. And that's what's really great about this technology is you can just make it bigger and it becomes more sensitive. So the bigger it is, the more likely you are to have seen some a dark matter interaction. And so we've also got a load of other features coming in. Like we have a, what's called an external veto, which is like a detector around the edge that will detect any particles coming in, like neutrons, for example, that will give the same signal as the dark matter within the detector. But we can veto them because we've seen them coming in. And dark matter interacts so rarely that it would be a miracle to see it one time, let alone if we saw it. So has it ever interacted? Well, we've never seen it. So, I mean, the thing is about it, th this search, is that we are making some assumptions due based on some theory that kind of says that dark matter will interact via the weak force with xenon in this way. And it's, it's very well motivated in terms of the theory, but there, in reality, like physics does not always align with what we think it will, you know, we, it doesn't always work. So we, we're kind of, it's a very similar search to the Higgs boson. So the, I mean, everyone's heard of the Higgs boson. The theorists came up with it 30, 40 years ago, and they only just detected it now. So it's kind of a very similar thing. We've got the theorists have come up with these, these sort of particles, and we think that this is what they'll do. Um, so we have to just try and detect them in the same sort of way. Are you sure that the layers of rock above you and around you are not masking? What if they're getting all the hits and it's not getting to you? Well, that, that's a good point, but the rock... So the idea is, is that right now, in dark matter is coming through as about I was saying like one particle per pint or something like that. Um, the, the, the sort of material the rock is made of is lighter actually. Xenon's very heavy and the interaction probability of the dark matter with, with any sort of atom it scales with the size of the atom. So it scales with, with the atomic number squared which is like the weight of the atom squared. So the heavier the thing is the more likely it is to interact. So it's a very good point. It could, it, I mean, there's no reason it, it can't be interacting in the rock on the way down. But, you know that that rock is generally lighter than the xenon, so yes, it's less likely. Yes, it's less likely. And, and it just helps us immensely by cutting out all the cosmic rays. It cu cuts out all the background. We'd never have, if we had a detector up here, it would be lit up all the time. I want to see that. 
want to see the. Want to see that? Well, the detector. You want to see it? Let's see that all the time. It's not very interesting because it's in a big tank of water, so you just see the, the water tank, unfortunately. Like, no, it's, <laughs> but no, it's, 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 it's um, it, you know, we might not see anything. We might build the bigger one. We still might not see anything. But the the thing is, is we could rule things out, and that's kind of all we can do right now. Until we actually detect a particle, we can just we only can rule things out and say, okay, we know it's not here. We should keep looking in in these other places. So, I mean, it's, it is important. Like someone asked before, what is the importance of this stuff? Like, why do we want to find it? And <clears throat> In terms of the gain for the human race, it's only in terms of expanding our knowledge and actually understanding the universe that we live in. Um, and it would give us a handle on what might happen in the future. We might be able to understand the universe well enough to know in the future whether it will keep on expanding into nothing, whether it will collide, collapse back in. We, you know, there's a lot of, um, basically, the, the composition of the universe is like the biggest mystery in physics today because we don't understand 96% of it. Uh, we only understand the 4% that makes up us, the atoms and the electrons and the photons. You know, we, we understand that, but that's only 4% of the entire universe. So, the, I mean, the dark matter is only 27%, so there's a whole other big lump, which is dark energy, which I don't know that much about, other than it causes the expansion of the universe.